talk today is a continuation of what I um, presented in, in April. It was an update on pelvic venous disorders, and uh, we had discussed the etiology and the pathophysiology of uh, venous disorders in the pelvic area. And today, uh, we're going to talk about how should patients with symptomatic pelvic venous insufficiency be treated. So as with everything else, uh, you know, all uh, other disease processes that we see in our body, there is some role for medical therapy, although not a whole lot in uh, patients who have been diagnosed with uh, pelvic venous disorders. Um, this medical part of the therapy includes psychotherapy, psychotropic drugs, including gabapentin and amitriptyline, analgesics, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, mainly for symptomatic relief, Dihydroergotamine, um, it's a vasoconstrictor, so in theory can cause less congestion. Progestins, uh, including contraceptives, hormone replacement therapy, danazol, um, GnRH agon agonist, uh, which includes gosrelin, acetate, these are, all have been tried. Hello? Can you yes, hear me? Yeah, you. You can I can hear, hear you. Okay, all right, yeah. good. So uh, the majority of these medications have, uh, do not have sustained effect and they have a long-term long uh, side effect, so have not been able to form the mainstay of treatment. Venoactive drugs is something which has uh, come into the fore uh, more recently, and uh, we are seeing more and more patients being put on this, both for the superficial venous disorders as well as for deep vein disease. Uh, we'll talk about that in, a, in the next slide. Um, medroxyprogesterone acetate has been shown to relieve symptoms in approximately 40% of patients, and a combination of MP and psychotherapy may be effective in around 60% of patients. There are, however, no randomized controlled trials on these drugs, and these are just single center observational uh, studies, a small number of patients, uh, and the data has been extrapolated from that. So a little more about the venoactive drugs, uh, particularly the micronized purified flavonoid uh, fraction. You know, here we, it's the diacemin simplex complex, which uh, everybody knows uh, as vasculera, and then you have the generics also available. They have a protective and tonic effect on the venous and capillary wall and increases the venous tone. So there is one uh, group out of Russia, Gavrilov uh, and his uh, uh, partners, he, they do a lot of research and do a lot of publications on uh, uh, pelvic venous disorders. And they published a study uh, and, uh, from their center in 2016 in where they treated uh, patients who had chronic pelvic pain um, associated with pelvic varicose veins with uh, MPFF uh, at 1000 milligrams a day for eight weeks and uh, had a significant improvement in the patient's uh, pain and the symptoms disappeared at 14 weeks. And this was, uh, they were able to uh, show long-term uh, benefit from this up to six to nine months. Uh, so it is an adjunct to the uh, other treatments, uh, you know, the more definitive treatments uh, in the form of invasive therapies that we offer the patient. And uh, the only uh, drawback here is that uh, vasculera is, is uh, pretty expensive and you know being a branded medicine it's and some people cannot afford it so i but i guess the um, over the counter um, generics uh, can be substituted so that for in my uh, practice i i'm pretty liberal with starting patients on uh, uh, mpff uh, drugs now coming to the definitive treatments, you know, surgical treatment was the initial uh, thought when the, this whole disease process was discovered and uh, they were still trying to figure out what should be the, the, the way to treat this. Laparoscopic ovarian vein ligation was presented as an alternative in the 1980s. You know, it's a, it's a more invasive procedure. They injected CO2, created a pneumoperitoneum and did laparoscopy, uh, which, uh, Basically, they were not really able to get to the total number of varices and the, and the treatments were incomplete, essentially. And of course, it requires general anesthesia. And there's not much uh, uh, data out there. It's just small case series that have been reported. Again, the treatment is based initially because on the pathophysiology and the etiology. So reflux was considered the, the main culprit behind patient symptoms. So they are basically treating the refluxing veins here. Um, hysterectomy was uh, another alternative when there's nothing left to do, the, you know, let's just do a hysterectomy and 
again, uh, the out outcomes and the results were not that great. 33% of the, a third of the patients treated with hysterectomy still had a residual pelvic pain and recurrence happened in about 20%. And I think this may be, again, the reason behind the uh, patient's persistence of symptoms is because uh, reflux may not be the reason or it's not the dilated uh, uh, venous plexi around the ovarian and the periuterine uh, uh, structures. It's mainly the compression of the vein. So if the patient has compressive etiology as the reason behind the discomfort, the hysterectomy is not going to take care of it. So then moving on to the endovascular treatments, transcatheter embolization therapy um, was the first reported case of uh, uterine ovarian varices. Embolization was described by Edwards in 1993. And uh, so they have to be venographically identified, uh, pathologically dilated axes with retrograde flow, and then uh, you occlude them. You know, the occlusion can happen from a variety of mechanical devices, including coils with or without sclerotherapy, and also glue has been used and has been reported in literature. Uh, the coils are the most commonly used devices, and embolization uh, is typically performed using a sandwich uh, technique or a mixed technique where you inject the uh, foam. I, and this is atoxysclerol is something that they use in Europe, but here we use uh, STS or sodium tetradecal sulfate. So you you know you prepare it by the Tesari method. You inject the foam, then you inject the coils on top of that, and then you inject foam on top of that again. Um, the only there is uh, some post procedure uh, pain involved when you know when the sclerose with the sclerosin more with the coils, and uh, there have been case reports of uh, coil migrations from especially the internal iliac veins. So, uh, and so internal iliac vein and the escape veins, uh, the recommendation is to more, use more foam than the coils. Um, ovarian veins do very well with the coil embolization. And I have a few uh, pictures going forward to show you how they do it. So this is a chemical embolization of the right ovarian vein on the left side of your screen. And um, on the right side, you see the catheter coming down the renal vein into the left ovarian vein and going up into the into the um, right ovarian vein and then the coils are injected and so it's basically cross embolization of the right ovarian from the left left side so this is basically uh, the first line of therapy now in patients who have uh, pelvic congestion syndrome or pelvic venous insufficiency and majority of the practices and interventional radiology practices will do that on a routine basis and you know these are very safe and simple procedures. You know access points can be common femoral vein, or it can be the cephalic, the brachiocephalic vein, or some, and the, or the internal jugular vein. The left side ovarian vein is much easier to cannulate compared to the right side because the right side ovarian vein arises directly from the inferior vena cava. The left side arises from the left renal vein uh, in majority of the patients. So. Um, and the outcomes are not too much different, whether you get both of them or or one of them. Then, of course, you know, vulvar varices uh, can be treated with foam sclerotherapy and coil embolization. And you can see this here, all the pelvic escape veins, in this, which we described in my previous uh, talk. Uh, they, they want to basically shut down all these uh, uh, collaterals to in order to relieve the venous hypertension in the pelvic area. So... It, it's not uncommon for us to see patients who had all this extensive embolization done uh, with maybe some partial relief for a few months or a few years and then recurrence of symptoms. So outcomes uh, of pelvic venous embolization, um, they're all over the place. Um, and this is in a, about 11 uh, studies, which are a meta-analysis of 11 studies, uh, which reported complete or partial improvement anywhere from 68 to 100% of the patients uh, based upon the VAS scores or visual analog pain scores. The treatment modalities were a combination of coils only versus coils plus sclerotherapy, glue and coils, glue only. And again, you see these are uh, uh, individual studies with patients anywhere ranging anywhere from 19 to 179. I think the biggest study was by Laborda's group with 179 patients in uh, which they use coils only, and uh, they've shown a pretty good uh, 
uh, improvement in their visual analog pain scores pre and post. And again, uh, this slide shows what was treated left ovarian versus right ovarian or bilateral and then iliacs, whether they were treated uh, on the left or the right or bilaterally. And what we have found, and this is uh, from our own, our, our Center for Vascular Medicine's uh, uh, experience that treating the left ovarian vein pretty much uh, will take care of the patient's symptoms uh, in the majority of these patients. And, and this, uh, these results have been um, replicated in uh, studies which have been done uh, outside and that majority of the times if you get to the left ovarian vein, the patient's symptoms improve. Yeah, if there is, they are going to prove uh, by embolization alone. So this, they, the focus was still on treating all the refluxing veins, trying to close them up to, you know, relieve the uh, venous hypertension. And in 2015, Dr. Dory, who's um, one of the vascular surgeons in uh, Tennessee, uh, his group presented this uh, study of a small study of 19 patients, and this was published in Journal of Vascular Surgery in 2015, where they evaluated patients who had predominantly pelvic symptoms and were found to have iliac vein uh, stenosis as well as ovarian vein reflux, but they were treated only with stenting. So then uh, the initial treatment was just to put in stents in these patients, and all of these were non-thrombotic non uh, venous outflow obstruction patients. And the follow-up was for a mean of about 11 months and uh, there was some remarkable results. Uh, complete resolution of pelvic pain in 15 of 19 patients. Dyspareunia got improved in 14 of the 17 sexually active patients and uh, uh, patients who had additional uh, lower extremity, left lower extremity pain or edema before treatment, 13 out of the 15 experienced complete resolution of, the, of their symptoms just with stenting alone. So, they concluded that this non-thrombotic obstruction of the of left CIV or IVC, or as we call as we call outflow disease or outflow obstruction, is an underappreciated cause of pelvic congestion syndrome. Angioplasty and stenting provides ex excellent short-term results with resolution of chronic pelvic pain and dyspareunia. So venous obstruction should be considered carefully, and and, and evaluated in, in for in these patients, and of course treated at the same time. So. Prior to this, majority of the patients would uh, not even be considered for uh, an intravascular ultrasound or evaluation of their iliac vein, uh, unless it was uh, for a specific uh, lower extremity recurrent uh, venous insufficiency or a post-thrombotic leg. Um, majority of the pelvic pain patients uh, would just undergo um, a mapping of their refluxing veins and uh, then coils or chemical embolization. So then at this at about the same time, we had started retrospectively analyzing our data for, uh, and this study was published uh, by uh, our group in 2018, um, actually it was 2017 and, and then was uh, on paper came out 2018, where we uh, looked at patients who had uh, come to us for uh, pelvic pain and lower extremity symptoms and we retrospectively analyzed the data and, and uh, this was uh, what we found that iliac vein stenosis is an underdiagnosed cause of pelvic venous insufficiency. So it pretty much replicated what Dr. Doherty had shown, but on a much larger scale, uh, about more than 10 times the number of patients that he, that he had looked at. So this was the demographics. Uh, average age was in the mid forties. Uh, pregnancies were about three and a half. Uh, and then, uh, 29 of these patients that had previous hysterectomy and there were, these were the other comorbid and gynecologic issues which had been evaluated and treated or were not found to be significant enough uh, to explain the patient's symptoms. So again, a retrospective chart review of uh, 220 women who underwent 227 procedures uh, between two, 2012 and 2015. As I said, complete gynecologic evaluation, uh, pre-op, lower extremity and ovarian vein, venous duplex was performed prior to uh, having the patients come in for a venogram. And uh, they had documented pre and post procedure visual analog pain scores. And that's how we followed up the outcomes of the study. Majority of the patients with ovarian vein embolization and obstructive lesions, they were treated with stage procedures. So our protocol used to be to have the patient come in, we do the embolization, wait for a couple of weeks, assess for any outcomes in improvement. And if not, 
uh, we, the patient would undergo an IVUS guided uh, stent placement. A subset of these patients were treated with simultaneous embolization and stenting. So at the same setting, due to uh, patient requests because of travel restrictions or some other logistic problems that we had to do this, both the procedures at the same setting. So these were the pre-procedure and the post-procedure procedure vein, vein scores in the different subgroups of patients, so ovarian vein. So the patients were divided into embolization alone, embolization plus stenting, stenting alone, embolization plus plasty, and plasty alone. So the pre-procedure pain scores were pretty consistent, 7.4 in the embolization group, 8.6 in the embolization plus stenting group, 8.78 in the stenting group, and so forth. Uh, Post-procedure pain score that you see with embolization from 7.41, it went down to 3.14, but in patients with uh, embolization and plus stenting, it, they went from pre-procedure of uh, 8.6 to 1.63, and stenting alone, interestingly, from 8.78 to 1.48. So there was significant relief in, uh, in patients' visual analog pain scores post-procedure, and more so seen in the stenting alone group versus the stenting plus uh, embolization or the embolization alone group. And these were all statistically significant. So um, 88 of the patients received a vein vein embolization followed by stenting, and 39 had simultaneous embolization and stenting in this subgroup. Uh, and then uh, in the staged group, only nine patients reported improvement after embolization. So basically after the, the first procedure, when we waited a couple of weeks, uh, only nine of these patients had reported improvement and the rest of the uh, 79 patients uh, had no improvement in their, in their symptoms and were, so, so they had a stenting procedure done. So, and then we did a breakdown of the patients who underwent uh, Simultaneous stenting uh, with embolization versus staged uh, stenting after embolization. And what we found that patients who had a staged procedure had slightly increased uh, improvement in their visual analog pain scores compared to those who had uh, simultaneous uh, stenting with embolization. And so one of the reasons was, uh, which is, or one of the theories put forward was because of the pelvic reservoir, which was persisting uh, maybe the, there was a slightly better improvement uh, in the uh, patients who had a stage procedure. So all the, once we published the study, uh, you know, which is kind of a little uh, um, first of its kind in the, in the ven deep venous world because nobody had looked at iliac vein outflow obstruction as a cause for pelvic congestion syndrome or pelvic venous insufficiency beside Dr. Doherty's uh, 19 patient study. Uh, and there was a lot of uh, you know, controversy which was generated in all these big national meetings. So we, I, within our group, we came up with this hypothesis uh, that women with combined iliac vein outflow obstruction and ovarian vein reflux will demonstrate improvement in their pain scores just with stenting alone. So instead of subjecting them to the coils and the chemical, we should just directly look at their uh, iliac vein outflow obstruction by the intravascular ultrasound, treat that, and then follow up the patient after that to see if they, they require additional procedures or not. So based on that, this is what we started to do. Essentially, we, um, and I, I'm presenting like two or three cases just to demonstrate what led to our next uh, small study that we published uh, uh, with good results. So this was uh, a patient was seen in uh, August of 2020, 37 year old female, gravitas six, para six, pelvic, presented with pelvic pain, dyspareunia, dysmenorrhea, labial varicosities for 15 years. And, you know, this is represented a venogram on the left side, uh, right and left iliac veins. You can see here with the dye, that's the inferior vena cava. And then we selectively cannulated the left ovarian vein, seems to be pretty dilated and it's filling up over the periuterine veins. And if we stay long enough and put in more dye, we can definitely see crossover going to the right side. So significant pelvic uh, collaterals in this patient. So as the pro new protocol that we adopted, now we documented uh, the reflux and then we put in an IVUS catheter and the patient had a bit of 60% compression in her left common iliac vein and she was stented with a 16 by 120 Bardwin over stent. And of course, uh, you know, we, we, we follow up these patients closely, uh, much on short, much shorter intervals during the beginning part 
uh, for the first uh, three months and then six months and then yearly after that. And the last uh, follow-up pelvic pain score, uh, which was a maximum of eight, can used to be zero. This is another patient, 37-year-old female, uh, treated in July 2020, gravida 5, para 3. Again, pelvic pain, dyspareunia, dysmenorrhea, vulvar varices, and in addition, she also had, had, had multiple uh, recurrent uh, superficial venous insufficiency requiring procedures since 2018. And she had a traumatic back injury when she was a teenager and she had screws put in at that time. So this was her venogram on the right. This is the left. You can see some hypogastric reflux on the left side and then selective catheterization of her ovarian vein. And this is the periuterine veins up here showing reflux and cooling and congestion. And again, she underwent uh, documentation of that and then an IVUS was put in and she had about 84% compression in her left common iliac vein and was stented with a 14 by 160 Bardwinova stent. And again, last follow-up showed pelvic pain score of maximum of seven reduced to zero and continues to do well. And I included this one just to show that, you know, patients, uh, and this is just, we get a, uh, not a lot, but we get a fair number of patients who have undergone all these embolization procedures without any relief. So um, this is just a patient who had one of, one of those patients, a uh, 37 year old female, gravida five, para four, presented with pelvic pain, dyspareunia, dysmenorrhea, recurrent SBI. She was actually came from Virginia Beach to us. Um, she had these symptoms ongoing for 10 years. She was a, uh, what you call a physical instructor um, and, you know, very athletic person, but having a lot of issues with her pelvic uh, area. And then and in the first instant, she did not tell us anything about uh, having a procedure done. The, all she recollected was that she had some superficial veins treated in 2010. And, uh, and of course, when we did an ultrasound and she was compressive, we recommended that she undergo a venogram. And when we put her on the table and you know, on the the x-rays show this uh, picture. And so after the procedure, we asked her, and then she kind of vaguely remembered that, the, that having this procedure done somewhere in one of these naval hospitals. And she said, but I never really had any improvement in my symptoms. So she had forgotten all about it, but she had extensive boiling of her bilateral ovarian veins, you can see on the right and the left. So her ultrasound, uh, intervascular ultrasound showed 91% compression and she was treated with 16 by 160 Bardwin overstand. And uh, her visual analog pain scores can need to remain to zero for a maximum of eight. Uh, so this led to the, our next uh, uh, publication, which was done, uh, which, which we published in uh, September, 2021 at Journal of Vascular Surgery titled Pelvic Vein is Insufficiency Secondary to Iliac Vein Stenosis and Ovarian Vein Reflux Treated with Iliac Vein Stenting Alone. So basically, uh, we collected data of 82 patients and however, only 38 of these had six month follow-up and were included in this analysis. So the patients who had uh, pelvic pain secondary to combined Iliac Vein Stenosis and, and Ovarian Vein Reflux Treated with Iliac Vein stenting, stenting Alone were included in this study. Again, they had a complete uh, gynecologic evaluation. We documented the pre and procedure, post uh, procedure visual analog pain scores. Uh, they underwent a transabdominal duplex scan. Then, you know, of course, the routine stent type diameter, length of ovarian vein diameters, everything was documented. Patients underwent diagnostic monography, and we looked at their pelvic varices, the left ovarian veins, uh, and then, of course, the IVAS of their inter of the iliac veins was performed. We measured the ovarian vein diameters intraoperatively. Um, and then of course, we the pelvic reservoir, this was defined by the presence of uh, three or more pelvic venous segments with or without cross pelvic collaterals. So the demographics majority of these patients were uh, Caucasian, gravitas status was 2.45. Um, and these are the other comorbidities these patients had. So the pre-procedure visual analog pain scores were divided into two subsets, pelvic pain with associated dysmenorrhea and pelvic pain with associated dyspareunia. So <clears throat> pelvic pain with dysmenorrhea, pre-procedure uh, visual analog pain score was 6.86 and after treatment uh, got, went down to 1.7. Dyspareunia scores was 4.3 uh, and went down to 0.41. The AVIS did show significant uh, compression in these patients, 74% on an average. The ovarian vein diameter was 6.6. .6, um, and uh, 
majority of these patients had stenting done in the left common iliac vein. Uh, wall stents were the uh, were the ones used in majority of these patients because prior to 2000 and uh, I think 17 or 18, um, we did not have uh, the uh, nitinol stents available. The wall stents were the only ones which were available. Uh, pelvic reservoirs was present in uh, 17 of the 38 patients. And the re-intervention rate was about 18%, seven of the 38 patients. So out of the 38 patients, uh, nine had persistent symptoms and 29 had complete resolution. I think about 76% had complete resolution of their symptoms. Out of the non-responders, we broke them down as to what were the main presenting complaints. Eight of them had dysmenorrhea as the main presenting complaint. One had dyspareunia. Out of the eight dysmenorrhea patients, six had no improvement and two had partial improvement. Uh, one of the dyspareunia patient had partial improvement. Uh, one no improvement patient had stenting and followed by embolization, again with no symptom improvement and was subsequently found to have a labral tear and underwent an orthopedic repair with complete resolution. So, and these are the indications for reintervention. Basically, uh, majority of these patients uh, required contralateral stents, meaning if the stent was put in the left side, we they had to come back and we had to stand the right side for new symptoms. Uh, two of these patients required extensions on the ipsilateral side. And as I said, one had a very main embolization without any relief and was found to have that orthopedic issue with, you know, for her pelvic uh, pain. So in conclusion, uh, our study showed the majority of women, of, uh, women with the pelvic venous insufficiency secondary to combined iliac vein stenosis and ovarian vein reflex demonstrated complete resolution of the symptoms with stenting alone. And uh, eight of the nine partial responses were primarily observed in women whose primary complaint was dysmenorrhea. So dysmenorrhea has kind of been a, uh, a tough nut to crack. Uh, we don't know whether this is uh, from the compression of the vein, from the congestion of the uh, of the pelvic uh, collaterals and and ovarian veins and and or versus hormonal, so maybe it's multifactorial. And you know, a lot of the literature out there does suggest that about 15% of patients who come to pelvic who come with the pelvic pain and have been found to have vascular issues also still have other issues contributing to uh, to their. Uh, uh, to their uh, symptoms, so and that's what kind of it gets, rep, you know, uh, what we see in our uh, in our outcomes and in our results that about ten to fifteen percent of the patients will still have persistent symptoms despite uh, doing everything by stenting and embolization, and uh, you know we send them for physical therapy, pelvic floor exercises, um, you know, urogyne evaluations, and you know injections or into their pubic muscles and stuff like that. And there is still um, not much relief. So, and then those, those, those are kind of uh, uh, patients that you, we wish something we can, you know, have a magic wand and get, get rid of the symptoms. But, but that, that's something that we've, we've seen now uh, since we've been doing this for the last uh, 10 odd years. Um, so again, the data suggests that in women with pelvic reservoir who demonstrate partial symptom resolution uh, after iliac vein standing alone, they, we should proceed with the ovarian vein embolization. Um, so from our data, what we recommended is that iliac vein stenting alone should be performed as the primary therapy and embolization should be reserved for women who have partial response to stenting and have a known uh, pelvic reservoir. Now, you, we will get sometimes patients who are gravita zero, para zero with significant pelvic pain, and of course, they want everything done. And if they have been referred by their pelvic uh, physical therapist or pelvic pain specialist, uh, they would want embolization done to, to be done first. But if when you start interrogating, there is uh, like a two millimeter ovarian vein, and there is two millimeter size uh, small transpelvic collateral, so there's nothing really to embolize in them. And the main main issue becomes compression of the vein, and you know, of course, you treat them. Once you treat them, uh, majority of these will have patients will have complete relief of their symptoms. So, I before I ended the talk, I wanted to show this uh, uh, venogram uh, pictures from uh, Dr. Papa's archives when he was uh, chief of vascular surgery at Brooklyn Hospital. This was a patient, a young female patient, he had who had complained of uh, mid epigastric pain and undergone. Uh, 
a, a lot of workup in the form of colonoscopies, endoscopies. I think they did a CT abdomen too, where uh, I think there was some concern about raised about possible uh, renal vein compression. So since we have are talking about compressive etiologies, I think it's uh, appropriate to show a, a renal vein stent. So this patient underwent a venogram, and you can see the uh, there's a, a dilated ovarian vein and with a lot of reflux, and then uh, there's a lot of uh, periuterine veins and uh, transpelvic collaterals seen too. <clears throat> you can see the filling of the ovarian vein on the other side from in dye injection into the left ovarian vein and nice transpelvic collaterals going across. So this patient underwent embolization in the form of coils. Um, um, and then at the same time, uh, they measured the uh, left renal vein and they had a, actually a CT abdomen prior to that, which had shown that there was compression. Um, so basically, if you look at the pressure numbers, which uh, are out there in literature, the pressure difference between the left renal vein and the inferior vena cava should be less than one millimeter of mercury in a normal person. And anything which is greater than three millimeters of mercury is considered significant. So, and then this, the nut, there's a difference between nutcracker phenomenon and nutcracker uh, uh, syndrome. Phenomenon is just the compression of the vein, which you see of the left renal vein between the aorta and the superior mesenteric artery. But when you start manifesting symptoms and the most commonly described symptoms of course are uh, flank pain in hematuria, uh, then it becomes nutcracker syndrome. Uh, but also mid epigastric pain and uh, paramblycal pain has also been associated with patients who, have, and pelvic pain have been associated with uh, patients who have nutcrackers. So in any case, this patient uh, then underwent uh, a stent placement to her left renal vein, and this is a wall stent, which was deployed with very good results. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, when appropriately evaluated, most patients with pelvic congestion syndrome do have iliac vein stenosis, and whether it's May Turner or not, or whether it's some other uh, compression, uh, compressive etiology uh, that is determined by the intravascular ultrasound. So treating the stenosis with or without embolization of the fluxing veins will lead be to better outcomes for pelvic and associated uh, lower extremity symptoms. Um, we do have short-term data with a, with a small 38-patient uh, study followed over six months. We are collecting data for trying to do, get about 100 patients over for six months, and hopefully by next year, we should have that uh, follow-up uh, on those patients. And uh, traditionally, the way to treat these patients have been to uh, basically close the refluxing veins. So these are those have been the and embolization has been the traditional method, and we hope that it becomes a historical method and the first first step by majority of the community out there who do this work should be uh, evaluation for compression and treating the compression first. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. All right. If uh, nobody has any questions, I'm going to log off. You have a great day and a great weekend, guys.